Hey Cornerstone Online, my name is Josh and I'm so glad that you're here today worshiping with us. This morning is going to be so encouraging and for all you dads out there, happy Father's Day. We're so psyched that you're worshiping with us online today. Let's dive in together. Separate your steadfast love, who can escape your faithfulness in endless sea? So full of grace and mercy, we sing, God is so good. has been restored Forgiveness flows from your veins Your kindness shown in all your ways We sing God is so friends. Uh, Before we dive in to Thad's message, I want to just let you know that as a team and as a church, we are committed to praying and committed to praying for you. And we would love to know how we can best be praying for you right now in this season that you're in. 
So right now there's a link that's getting dropped into the chat and we just wanna encourage you, click that link, fill out a prayer request because we wanna be able to pray for you this week when we gather as a staff on Tuesdays in Litchfield and Wednesdays in Cocado to pray for what you're asking for. So let us step into what God's doing in your life, where he's leading you, the challenges, the victories. We want to be with you in this. So click the link, fill it out. That'd be awesome. Let's dive into God's word. Open your apps, open your Bibles. Let's hear it now. Good morning, Cornerstone. Pastor Thad here. So excited to be with you. If you've got your Bibles, turn over to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 12 and 13. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 12 and 13. To start out with, I just want to say happy Father's Day. Dad, love you. Happy Father's Day to you. Now, uh, as a father myself and knowing my dad and, and knowing others, dads particularly... Um, appreciate uh, Ron Swanson. So, or once Ron Swanson. So, uh, here's a little clip in honor of Father's Day to teach us a valuable lesson. Would you like to sample our vegan bacon? 100% meatless. Yes, please. Another, please. S sir, is there a problem? I'm just making sure no one ever has to eat this. I, I don't think I can give you any more. I want one. I love that clip. And as it is Father's Day, I just want to say, dads, I hope you get a nap today. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're uh, kind of taking dad out today or cooking for dad today, give him the real meat. Give him something salty. Give him something greasy, high cholesterol. Uh, let this be a special day. Uh, for dad. That would be my hope for all of you dads out there. Again, happy Father's Day. So if you got your Bibles there, you're open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Uh, I, I want to communicate today that today we're talking about something so important. Paul here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he's communicating here to the church that, hey, I want to remind you to do these things things, okay? And actually here in chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, he gives us so much. And even beyond this, and he even kind of buckshot, like he's just shooting everywhere with, hey, remember this, and remember this, and remember that. But for today, we're going to focus on just one thing that he asked the church at Thessalonica to remember. And then next week, we'll look at the other big main thing he asked the church to do. But Again, for our time today, we're going to look at one thing. So let's read it. Here we go. Verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So in these two verses, what is Paul asking the church to remember to do? He is asking them uh, to respect, to actively appreciate the servant leaders that are over them. Now, listen, this can be a lot of people. This could be leaders in general. This, in general, this could be like your Bible study leaders or your small group leaders. But this could also mean that this is um, elders in the church, right? And actually, I think if if you're really asking me, I think he's probably talking more about the uh, elder leaders, servant leaders, or the elder pastor, servant leaders, maybe than, maybe than just a general leader. Uh, and so what I want to do here, because some of these principles are the same, I, I, I'm going to talk about, you know, and kind of uh, frame it and how we should look at those who are over us in the Lord generally. But there'll be a couple of moments where I say, hey, this is particularly for elders, or this is particularly for elder 
pastors, okay? And so I'm going to try to draw those points of distinctions out for you. Um, but really, these are some things that we should be uh, doing. This respect that we should be showing is to, is to really any leader in the church, any servant leader that is over us. Now, again, I said it's so important for us to get this. You know, we can't just... Um, you know, kind of go to sleep in our pews, so to speak, or just kind of zone out. Because I want to give you one statistic here that will hopefully hopefully draw out the importance of what Paul is sharing with the church at Thessalonica. So this is a stat from a study done by Barna or the Barna Group in 2020. It says this, more than 4,000 churches closed their door in 2020. In that same year, over 20,000 pastors left the ministry, and hear this, 50% of current pastors said they would leave the ministry if they had another way of making a living. Something's wrong with that. Something's wrong about how we treat our leadership, how we treat each other in the church, and again, next week, we're going to talk about how we treat each other, but Something is wrong when 4,000 churches closed their door in America in 2020, 20,000 pastors left the ministry, and 50% said that they would leave or seriously consider leaving the church. Something's not right. There's a spiritual warfare. There's a dynamic that is unhealthy in the church, and Paul speaks to this. So quickly, let me pray, and we'll jump in and hear from the Apostle Paul how we should treat our leaders, how we should think about them how we should understand what they do. So let me pray. Father God, I pray that you'd speak to this broken vessel. God, this can be a little bit of an interesting sermon for me to preach because I fall in one of these categories. So Father God, I pray that um, I would be able to uh, give your word and how we should think about our leaders in the church. And God, also that those of us who are out there who are leaders, Lord, let us be um, convicted and concerned, Lord, that we are living out our calling in a right way before our people. Lord Jesus, let us serve. Let us serve one another. Let us love one another for your glory and let us respect our leaders. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so looking in verse 12, here we go. It says this, now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. So I just wanna break it down and look at that, that, that word there, those words there, those who work hard among you. Listen, when I'm calling you to respect leaders, those people who are over you, there should be a dynamic in their life that you see that should make it easier for you to respect them. This dynamic of they are people who are working hard among you. I mean, any servant leader, any person uh, that I'm calling to you to respect today, they should be proven in their hard work among you. Even with eldership in 1 Peter 5, uh, verses 1 through 4, Peter writing says, to the elders among you, and then he goes on to say, listen, we shouldn't uh, lord our elder leadership over those we're entrusted to, but we should be examples to the flock. Listen, in our daily life, in our ministry, in our work among the brothers and sisters in the Lord, we should be known as people who work hard. We should have a, a, a there's our characteristic or one of our characteristics should be that we work hard among the people of God. And as I'm sitting here in this moment and, and I'm talking to you, uh, to, to the body about respecting these individuals, these servant leaders over them, it should not be hard for them, you leaders out there, because you indeed do work hard among them. I wanna give you just a couple of illustrations here in regards to this idea of servant leaders and leaders in the church, how they should be working hard and how we should be able to see this. And because we see this, be able to respect them and how they work hard among us. Years ago, I was new at a church and one of my first uh, Sundays there, it was very snowy, very cold. And I remember walking in, there was this gentleman, the the snowblower had apparently broken that morning. And so he's out there in his uh, nice clothes, khakis, whatever, boat shoes. And he's out there just absolutely shoveling away in the snow, got his toboggan on, all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, man, here's a great uh, servant of God. I mean, who is this guy? I mean, so I went and I asked some other leaders and I was like, you know, who is this gentleman? 
And he gave me his name and I wanted to find out a little bit more about him. So I kind of dug because I wanted to go up to him and say, hey, listen, man, you're an example. You are out here cleaning off the sidewalks, shoveling the snow. Um, I just want to tell you how much this means to me and, and how much I, um, I see you in that moment, working hard, being a servant leader, um, being a, a servant to all and how much that means to me. Turns out this gentleman was a chief financial uh, officer of one of the larger companies in the greater Peoria area. And here he was, uh, snoveling show, now, sh- shoveling snow. Now, he was there that morning to be a door greeter, but he heard about the snowblower breaking. And so he actually got out there, got his jacket back on, put everything back on, and shoveled snow so that people could walk safely into the building. John Austin is a guy that everyone could respect and everyone did respect. In fact, it was so much fun. Uh, so when John would go around and recruiting people to ministry and things like that, he'd walk around with a piece of paper with a ministry title on the top and he'd have all these like open uh, blank areas or, or times to serve in a certain ministry. And he would go up to you and John wouldn't say, hey, we've got this awesome ministry event happening. It's so cool. I would love for you to be a part of it. I think you'd be great for that. Listen, you know, would you mind serving that ministry? John didn't do it that way. He would go up there and say, hey, there's this awesome ministry that's going on and I've got openings at three and at six. Which one do you want, right? And listen, John could do that because people respected John. They respected him because he knew he worked hard among them and they were willing and they desired to work with him and to help him. I'd also mention this same guy would volunteer nine months, he and his wife, out of the year, year or two, Uh, serving kids ministry. And then they would take off during the summertime and kind of recharge and then go back because not only did they love children's ministry, but they realized that um, that ministry was so uh, important and there needed to be a continuity. And and, and just with the ratios of adults to kids, they just knew that it was was important. It was a big deal and it needed that continuity. And so they would give of their time and, and they would go and they would serve in kids ministry nine months out of the year. He worked hard among his people, and they respected him. Leaders, we must be working hard among our people to to help them. Yes, the Bible calls them to respect us, but listen, we need to be working hard to make it easier for them to respect us. And so we need to respect those who work hard among us. I'd also say this, um, church, that in my experience, leaders, Bible study leaders, small group leaders, elders, pastoral staff, uh, elder pastors. In my experience, these people do work very, very hard. In fact, if you just ask their wife and kids, they'd probably tell you that they truly do pour out their lives for you, that they give their lives, that they spend their lives for the greater body. Much like a small business owner, if you can imagine this, it doesn't stop at five. Just because the the time reads 5 p.m. doesn't mean the phone calls stop. In fact, they still come. And you know what? They, those leaders don't complain. They understand that's a part of it. But just like a small business owner, th- there is a great, um, there is a sacrifice there where you say, I'm going to pick up the phone or I'm going to return the phone call or I'm going to get, um, uh, I'm going to grab my jacket and I'm going to go and I'm going to meet someone where there's a need uh, or I'm going to go and I'm going to go to that extra meeting. Your leaders work hard. They may call you to one meeting, but keep in mind, they're probably going to three or four others, uh, other meetings, both setting up for your meeting uh, and also encouraging others who may be in a similar position to yours. Our leaders work hard. When you talk about elders or the pastorate or staffing, uh, staffing in ministry, Several years ago, I was reading um, an article about the most stressful jobs in the world. The number one job in the world for stress was president of the United States. In fact, you can look in pictures of presidents and you can see how they go into office and they're not that gray and they come out of office and they're very gray. Do you know what the number three job was, most stressful jobs in America? The third most stressful job in America was a pastor in a local church, a pastor in a local church. Understand here are leaders who, yes, there is a biblical authority, but here are leaders uh, that are trying to lead, trying to serve, 
trying to, to bring everyone together to follow after Jesus Christ. And in one sense, you have no incentive to follow them other than bib- being biblically obedient, but no incentive to follow them other by their inspiration and example to you. That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of stress. And we respect our leaders when we show them uh, the respect and understanding how they work hard among us. Um, it encourages them to work all the more harder. Man, your leaders work hard for you, and there's a stress involved. Work with them, not against them. Encourage them, respect them. One more illustration as we're talking about working hard, and then I'm going to transition. Um, and, and this one, this one really is just for the pastor elders. And, and again, when I'm when I'm talking about these things and the sacrifice that your servant leaders make, I, I'm not asking you to pity them, right? Many understand what they're getting into, right, as they serve the Lord in these ways. But I do want you to be aware of how they do work hard. And so, with this particular one, I want to talk about that pastor elder, that full time staff member called to the ministry. Um, and I want to talk about kind of a, a proving or a smelt, uh, smelting cauldron um, that really kind of proves out the metal of, of a pastor early in his ministry. But many times through questions that I have from others, um, people don't necessarily know this about their pastors. So let me say this. When I first got into ministry, one of the ministers told me, well, he told me two things I need to talk to you about or ask you about. He said, first thing is this, are you prepared to be hated? Now, like, what are you talking about? This is ministry. What do you mean be hated? And so, and he went on to explain what that, what that means. And we won't talk too much about that, or we won't talk about that, that now. Um, but he also said, are you, are you ready for lifelong learning and for a, a large portion of that to be formal? And I was like, you know, what do you mean? He's like, listen, pastors are, pastors have so many unique challenges from so many diverse angles that they need a good education. And they're one of the elders who hold up the doctrine and integrity of the church. And so understand that if you're called to the ministry, you're called to education. Remember that in America and even in the world, there were at one time three queen sciences. There was law, there was medicine, and there was theology. You see, there's this idea that there's your civic life and law protects your civic life. And then there's this temporal life and medicine protects your temporal life. But then there's theology that protects your spiritual life. You see, why would we go to a lawyer if he didn't have a standard uh, law degree? Or would we go to a doctor or a pharmacist who did not have some type of medical degree? Well, of course we wouldn't. Then when we talk about something as important as your spiritual life, wouldn't we also expect that, I hate to use the word professional, but those called to a vocational, vocational is a better word, also to study and have their degrees? You see, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a standard ministerial degree uh, for the pastor requires four years of undergraduate education, and then an additional three to four years of graduate work for the Masters of Divinity, which is the standard uh, professional degree, vocational degree for a pastor. Understand that that degree is roughly equivalent to a Juris Doctorate, a law degree for others, or a PharmD degree for a pharmacist, uh, or or even a nursing uh, doctorate. And of course, there's other uh, graduate programs that pastors can enroll, enroll in to become more specialized in ministry. You see, when pastors go into that education, when they go into that experience, it's a grinding point. It's a point of enrichment. Um, it's It's a place where they are grounded in the word, that they're grounded in faith and in the faith uh, history or the history of the faith to understand where, where we've come from in theology. They're, they're schooled in matters of social science, counseling, leadership, even some types of social work. And also into how God, in regards to how God made us and how we experience God. Do you realize that in your pastoral classes, you're even, now you just scratched the surface, but you're even trained in things like space space allocation within buildings. So much goes into what it means to be a pastor or a servant leader in the church. These people work hard. 
2 Timothy 2, 5, or 2.15 says this, do your best to present yourself as God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Listen, there are so many servant leaders out there who work hard. And listen, if you're, uh, if you're a leader out there, you need to make sure that you're working hard among your people. So uh, not just so that they would respect you, but you need to be an example to them. And then body, we need to respect our leaders. Listen, they work hard. And so here's one thing that I would ask you. Because they work hard, respect them and work with them. They want only the best for you. Well, listen, I've got to kind of get, get past that because i got some more to say here. But listen, leaders out there, you need to be working hard, pouring your life out for the people, pouring your life out for the body. That's a part of your calling. But body, you need to be out there and you need to be respecting your leadership. They work hard for you. You need to work with them. Return those emails, those phone calls. Show up when you're supposed to show up for the ministry. They've worked so hard to make sure that they have people in positions where, where they need to be so that the ministry can move forward. Show up. Don't cancel, cancel unless there's an, a real emergency. Be available to them as they're working hard in the ministry. Again, I've got a transition. So looking there in verse 12, it says this. Again, so now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you. Again, they work hard, you work with them. Um, and then also, who are over you in the Lord. Now, this is a big one. What does it mean when they say, uh, or when Paul says, who are over you in the Lord. Well, in our context, what it would mean is a couple of things. That if someone is over you in the Lord, they've been called to serve as a pastor or a leader in the church, it means a couple of things. It means that they've been one called by God. It means that they've also, they're a person who's been qualified by the word. It also means that they've been affirmed by the church, particularly in regards of elder leadership or, or elder pastor leadership. First thing is this. Um, if they're in a position of leadership, they've been called by God to be in that position of leadership. There is a calling there. Um, one of the things I told when I was told when I was first going into ministry was, listen, if you're not called, you will quit. If you're not called, you will quit. Now, listen, stepping away for a time of refreshment, um, that is not quitting. But but listen, if you're if you're called into a service of ministry, there will be challenges there. And if you're not called, if that's not a part of the purpose of your of your life, then in time you'll quit. You'll quit. It's one of the reasons why I never try to convince anyone that they're a leader, that they should become an elder. I, I never try to do that. Now I've went to someone and says, you know, say, I've said that, you know, I think I see this in you or that I see that you're qualified for this or I believe that you would be a great fit, but I never try to convince someone that they're called to that. Only they can know that. I can say, I see some things in you. I feel like this must be the case, but I never try to push. And, and, and in fact, I've been in um, elder search processes where the person said, hey, listen, I don't feel called to this or I don't feel called to this right now or, or, or what have you. And I encourage them, be obedient to that. Listen to the Holy Spirit in that because the worst thing for you to do would be to come in and to not really be called and then to quit. And so I never try to convince someone of their calling. Um, that is something that is between them and God and is of utmost importance when they become a leader. But if someone does have that strong calling, again, we should respect them in that. So it's a calling. Also, they're qualified by the word. They're qualified by the word. In regards to elder leadership in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, again, Paul speaks about this. Here's a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart to being an overseer or elder, he desires a noble task. task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife, temperate, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome or a lover of money, must manage his own household well. Uh, he must not be a recent convert, and he must also have a good reputation with outsiders. And, and there's even um, other guidelines that Cornerstone has to kind of say, hey, listen, uh, we believe that you're a leader, or we believe that you're an elder leader in these things. Listen, so they're qualified by the, the word. And because they are qualified, because they are these things, then there's a level of respect that we should give them. And lastly, I would say this, they're affirmed by the body. Um, this is another reason why it's so important to, to be a member of a local church. 
Listen, when someone's being called to leadership, or in the case of an elder or pastor, uh, they're being called and they're affirmed by the body, this is your opportunity to say, praise God, yes, this person is a person that works hard, that I respect, that is qualified, that it has been called. I see it in their life. God has affirmed it. And now I, as a, as a part of this body, am affirming this, and they have my yes vote. Listen, if all these things are true, then we should respect those who lead well and lead among us and work hard. Again, if the person works hard, if they're called, called by God, qualified by the word and affirmed by the church, that is a person who is worthy of our respect. Last thing here in verse 12, also talks about one who admonishes you. This is so very difficult. Again, now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you, the Lord, and who admonish you. Now, again, this has a little bit more to do. It has a tone there of instruction, but it also has admonishment. So this is speaking maybe more to an elder or elder pastor. 2 Timothy 4.2 says this, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Understand as an elder, as an elder pastor, you have to do some challenging things. Now, listen, you get to encourage Right? And you need to have patience and careful instruction and all of these things, right? And there's a, like, I would say the majority of my ministry is more about encouraging than some of this other stuff. Um, but there is a part of my ministry and in part of other elders' ministry and elder pastors' ministry that has to do with admonishment. We have to speak into people's lives in areas of conflict, in areas that are very difficult. We speak into people's marriages. Can you imagine the tenseness of that? We speak into people's lifestyles. Pretty audacious, huh? We speak into areas and and how people spend their money, or should I say how they spend God's money. Sometimes it's very difficult to be that person. But we do it because we're called to do it. But it is challenging. And it's because of these challenges that we should respect them. Because understand this, guys, understand this. The Bible says that those in those types of leadership positions have an account. They are accountable to God for how they lead you well. And while they love to encourage you, believe me, I love to encourage you. Our elders love to encourage you. Encourage you. Our, our leaders love to encourage you. But we're also held to account by the Lord. And there are times when we are called to speak into your lives. And it's not always pleasant. I won't share stories, but it's not always pleasant. Some of you out there, you've experienced, say, Jeff Garland ministering to you, counseling you. Um, And as you look at him and you know how he served you, how would you feel if someone came and disrespected him? Right? There might be a little flare of anger there. Listen, just like you would respect a Jeff Garland, you need to respect the other leaders in this church. You know, if, if Jeff came to you or asked you to, to do something or um, I don't know, whatever it is, do you have that kind of respect? Again, work hard among you. Jeff works hard among you over time. But that's how we should be retreating, uh, treating all of our leaders because they do speak into conflict. They do speak into hard things and do things sometimes that aren't pleasant to do. Um, but yet we're called to do it. And, and there is a gratification, a reward there, but um, it makes it easier when we're respected and that we know that you know that we love you. Last thing, and I'm gonna turn to close here. It says this, hold them in the highest regard, verse 13, hold them in the highest regard in love. And this is interesting, because of their work and live in peace with each other. Now this work here, it, it's almost saying, in regards to everything else, respect them, but also respect them because of their position, because of their work, and live in peace with each other. It's kind of like a dad, right? Even in the qualifications, it says this in 1 Timothy 3, 4, it says, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with a proper respect. There's this dynamic here of position of leadership um, that there is a, a lo- almost like a loving father trying to help his home. 
let's say a dad comes home from work and the kids are fighting and they're angry and they're not at peace and they're disrespectful to the father. This hurts the father's heart. Sometimes you can respect a leader, an elder, a pastor, a staff member because of their position and because you understand all of the things that we've talked about and you understand who they are and who they've called to be. And again, when you respect them, when you love them, when you care for them as they love and respect and care for you, then you work with them and you have peace amongst yourself. So juxtaposition what I just said about dad coming home and the kids being all over the place. Dad comes home and the kids are uh, at peace. They're not fighting, right? They're, they're maybe a little, okay, I'll just say this. At least they acknowledge that dad is home. I won't say they come to him and say, oh, dad, I'm so glad you're home at home and give you a hug. Maybe I won't say that, but at least acknowledge that dad is home. Um, maybe that would be enough. But listen, body, when we live at peace with our pastors, when we respect them, when we love them, care for them, and when we live at peace with each other, and what we'll talk about in the weeks to come, and uh, we respect each other and we care for one another, uh, it makes the job of the ministry, it makes the job of leadership easier and even more rewarding. Hmm. Let me also say this. When you respect and you love your leaders, it makes them want to pour their lives out even more for you, serve you even more, to give their lives for you even more. And they just might become the leader that one day it will require no effort for them to, uh, for you to respect them and appreciate them because you believe in them. Respect them, esteem them in love, live in peace, and you'll bless them and you'll follow what the Apostle Paul has called us to do. Again, in light of so many pastors, leaders, church closing their doors, um, pastors leaving the ministry, all of these things, that we talked about early in the message, one of the ways to help that stop, to stop that trend or slow that trend down is to respect, esteem, and love the pastors, the leaders in your church. Uh, listen, one of the challenges I want to give you today is just to ask yourself this. How can you make the extra effort to respect, to appreciate, to love those servant leaders among you? Here's a couple things. Work with them, help them. Listen, um, if they weren't hopeful in you or if they didn't think that this was something that was really needed to be done, they would not be asking you to volunteer or to be uh, asking of your wisdom or, or to be asking anything of you. So work with your leaders. Show them respect. Show them respect because of, of, of who they are and working hard among you and show them respect because of their position that God has called them to and appreciate them. Maybe you have a Bible study leader or a group leader or a host home leader or a pastor or an elder that maybe has ministered to you in this year. And it's not Pastoral Appreciation Month, but maybe there's an opportunity that you could reach out to him this week and just say, hey, man, or lady in some cases, I so appreciate you. Uh, just a note, just a note to him and just saying how and why you appreciate them and how much you love them. Well, guys, that's all the time we have for today, but that's my challenge for you. Let me pray for you that you would hear from the Spirit how you can respect and uh, maybe even love on and bless and bless a leader in our church, a servant leader in our church this week. God, there's so many things, uh, unfortunately, that are going wrong in the church today. Too many churches are uh, closing their doors and losing ground when they should be, uh, God, gaining ground and having to open more doors as the gospel goes forward. Lord, the Apostle Paul addressed a real issue uh, that the church at Thessalonica and other places were having, and he was reminding them, make sure that you're respecting your leaders, that you're esteeming them in love, that you're appreciating them. God, help us this week to find a way to respect, uh, to esteem and love our leaders, and help us to be mindful of how we should think of them as they work hard among us. Amen. Amen.